we spoke about the, uh, the nature of faith, and in trying to define it, we talked about the opposite of faith. What is the opposite of faith? Non-belief is the absence of faith. But what is the opposite of faith? Meaning, meaning of course, faith in God. What is the opposite of faith in God? The quality or the characteristic that is the opposite of faith in God is faith in self, arrogance. So that belief in God means a turning outward from self to something above yourself. The opposite of that would be remaining within yourself. You either worship God or you worship yourself. Of course, there can be the gray area in between. You worship something other than yourself that isn't quite God, like money or fame or not any, any idols. That's someplace in between, it's in, the, in that twilight zone. You're not worshiping God and you're not quite worshiping yourself either. But the opposite of, of belief in God, of worshiping God, is not idolatry, but arrogance. And certainly, according to Hasidus and for, and for Jews, the struggle between right and wrong, the struggle between good and evil, is not what we generally describe as a moral struggle between behaving or misbehaving, between stealing or not stealing, between killing and not killing. That's, that's a choice that has to be made, but that's not where the, the average Jew should find his struggle. That shouldn't be the battlefield. That shouldn't be the front lines in the life of a Jew. Where the struggle should be, where the real challenge lies, is not in choosing right over wrong, and not in choosing good over evil, but in choosing God over self. In being bigger than self rather than within oneself. And if we look at the, at the, uh, what is beneath the surface in all of Yiddishkeit and in all virtues of Yiddishkeit, the message seems to be the same one over and over again. Don't do what pleases you, do what pleases God. Don't judge by how things appear to you. Listen to, find out, and care about how they appear to God. And that's why when it comes to the first Jew, the guy who set the tone and the pattern for all Jews for all time to come, how was Avraham uh, forged as the first Jew? Not so much by all the right choices that he made, by doing good and not bad, by being a nice guy and not a bad guy. He became a Jew through the tests, the ten tests that God put him through, in each case, he had to put himself aside and do what God wanted. So it wasn't just a question of right and wrong. It was a question of sacrificing the selfhood, sacrificing what seemed right to him in favor of what seems right to God. As a matter of fact, the first test that we're told of in the Torah, Gemara tells us about all ten tests, but in the Torah, in the, in the Chumash, it doesn't mention all ten tests. The test that it mentions first is when God tells him, Lech lecha me'artzecha. That he should leave his land. O me'ladutcha and the place of your birth. O be'sa'vicha and your father's house. And Hasidus explains, what are these three things? They read nicely, it's very poetic. But what, what, what's all this emphasis? Why isn't, it, why isn't it enough to just say, come to Israel with me? <coughs> why does he have to say, leave your land, your birthplace, your father's home? Each of them has a unique meaning and significance. Lech lecha me'artzecha, leave your, your land, also means leave your will. Because Eretz, which means land, is from the same root as Ratzon, which means will. So God tells Avraham, stop wanting what you want. Get yourself out of your wants. 
into what I want. O Melad Bitcha, and get yourself out of your birthplace. What is a birthplace? It's not just a, ge a geographical location. A birthplace means a set of habits, emotional habits, and a frame of mind with which you're born. So God is telling Avraham, get yourself out of your natural born condition. O Mibesa Vicha, and from your father's house. According to Kabbalah, father and house refers to Chachma and Bina, the faculties of intellect. So God is telling Avraham, don't want what you want, don't have the habits you're born with, and don't understand things the way you understand things. Come with me to Israel and I'll show you a whole new way of being. And Hasidus emphasizes that at that point, when God appeared to to Avraham to tell him to leave his father's home, Avraham was at least 52 years old. And by that time, he had already discovered God. He had already made it his lifelong ambition to spread the belief in God. He had already laid his life on the line three times in teaching people about God and refusing to believe in idols. And after all that, God says to him, no, 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 don't want what you want. What's wrong with what he wants? He says, don't, do these habits you have, not leave, leave your habits. You have pretty good habits. And don't think the way you think. He thought pretty good. So it's not that his habits were bad. It's not that his will was bad. And it's not that his mind was bad. He had a very good mind. What God was saying, leave your will. Good or bad, it's yours. It's, it's you. And as good and as wonderful as Avraham was, it was still just him. Not more than him. And that doesn't make a Jew. So the arena, the struggle, the battle, the, the, the issue is not good-bad. The issue is higher or lower. Are you higher than self or do you remain low by staying within yourself? Looking out for number one has got to be the most un-Jewish concept in the world. Theologically. The whole idea of Torah is revelation. The whole idea of revelation is that God makes himself known to people. And what that means, beside everything else, primarily what that means is that a human being because of the revelation, and particularly the Jew who is there at revelation, this human being is capable of leaving the limitations of who he happens to be and focus instead on God. To not do that is to not begin to practice Yiddishkeit, because that's the beginning of it all. When God came down to Mount Sinai and the Jews were overwhelmed, that's Yiddishkeit. Because for that moment, they forgot themselves. They were focused on something higher. They were focused on God. The Gemara says it in very dramatic terms. <clears throat> With every statement that God made, the Jews died and had to be revived. Whether we understand that literally is beside the point. What we can apply to this conversation. From that statement, every statement that God made, every commandment that God gave, the Jews died. In other words, they completely lost awareness of themselves. Their ego died. They were totally riveted with their mind, heart, and soul on God and forgot themselves. They were egoless. That's Yiddishkeit. That's the beginning of all real virtue. And that's on a theological level. On a psychological level, it would probably be safe to say that 
of all emotional disturbance and of all mental, uh, I don't want to say illness. Um, when, when the mind collapses under its burden or the heart collapses under its burden, emotional burden, 90% of the time it's because of arrogance. The problem is arrogance. And the more we feed our arrogance, the more the mind and heart is going to collapse under, under the burden of itself. The Gemara, the Mishnah, gives us good advice. It says, be not like an oak tree or a cedar tree. Be rather like a sapling. What does it mean? An oak tree is very strong. Can't push it around. And so it'll withstand all sorts of pressures. But sooner or later, if the wind is strong enough, if the hurricane is strong enough, it'll uproot even the, even the mightiest oak. On the other hand, the sapling can't maintain its position at all times because the wind bends it. All sorts of things can can bend it out of shape, which can't be done to the oak tree. But in the final analysis, in the end, no wind, no hurricane, no power can completely break the sapling. It keeps bouncing back. So the Mishnah says, don't, don't be strong like an oak tree, be strong like a sapling. Why? Because the strength of the sapling is much more real than the strength of the oak. And that's why sooner or later the oak must fall, the sapling won't. And what is it that makes the oak tree, the oak tree fall in the storm or in the hurricane? The very fact that it is rigid. The very fact that it won't give up. The very fact that it won't bend. In other words, it takes itself very seriously. Arrogance, at least for the purposes of this discussion, does not mean a high opinion of self. An arrogant person doesn't necessarily mean a person who thinks he has talents that he doesn't have, or who thinks that he's smarter than he is, or thinks that he's better than he is. An arrogant person is merely the person who thinks he's more important than he is, for whatever reason, or for no reason at all. Arrogance means taking yourself seriously. And therefore, arrogance includes the person who thinks he's a loser. Arrogance includes the person who thinks he's rotten. It includes the person who thinks that he amounts to nothing. Because no matter what you think of yourself, the fact that you think of yourself and that you take it very seriously, that is arrogance. Because if belief in God means taking God seriously, the opposite of that is taking yourself seriously. And there are people who believe in God but are angry at Him and don't like Him and disagree with Him. There are people who are angry at themselves and don't like themselves and they disagree with themselves but they're just as worshipful of themselves as the person who thinks very highly of himself. It's really the same thing in different, in different, in different disguises. So the Mishnah says, the strength of the sapling, the strength of the person who does not take himself seriously, may not be impressive at first glance, because somebody comes along and bends him this way, he bends, he bends him the other way, he bends the other way. Doesn't look like he has a spine. Doesn't look like he has any dignity and self-respect. He's not looking out for number one. He's letting himself be taken advantage of, and so on, and so on, and so on. The Mishnah says, look, 
look, look a little closer. Who cracks in the end? Only, only the guy who, who is looking out for number one. There are legitimate burdens, issues, tragedies or traumas that can overwhelm a human system and cause it to break down. Either the mind or the heart or both. There are such conditions. A uh, tragic and classic example is this Hasidic woman who was, uh, who was caught by the Russians because she was very active in uh, maintaining the yeshivas and then uh, keeping Yiddishkeit alive in the different communities and so on. Anyway, she was caught. And uh, they, were, they were putting all sorts of pressure on her to sign a confession and to implicate others, to give names of her. And of course she wouldn't. One day in the interrogation, they said to her that, that her game was up and the truth was out because her son had testified against her. Obviously, they didn't expect her to believe that. And she didn't believe it. What they were telling her was they had gotten some kind of a statement from her, from her son, which now puts the two of them in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bind. If what the son said was not true, then he'll be killed. If what the son said was true, she'll be killed. And now they're placing it on her, in her lap. They're saying, okay, now, how do you vote? Tell me your son is lying. And when they presented that to her, uh, in, a, in a very dramatic way, they didn't tell her that it was her son. They told her somebody had testified against her. And then they opened up a little window in her door, and uh, she saw her son there and realized what the game was. And before she could collect her thoughts, the shock of it, that, that, that mental uh, crunch of, be, of having to choose between her life and her son's life and so on, before she could collect her thoughts, she simply passed out and died. Because cause seeing her son there was overwhelming to the system and everything broke down. In, in, this, in this case, permanently. So there are legitimate conditions under which we can understand we can understand that that the system simply cannot function anymore under the burden that's been placed on it but that's rather rare but 90 percent of the time maybe more the reason the cause for the over for the overburdening of the system is not what happened, not the trauma of, of the events of life, but simply the unwillingness or the inability to reconcile what's happening with what I am, with what I want. And therefore, when a person is faced with a very distasteful and very painful circumstance, the first question that needs to be asked is not why is this happening? The thing you have to check is not the nature of the event. What needs to be checked is, what do you care? Obviously, you're caring very much. You're very disturbed by what's happening. But why are you disturbed? Why are you disturbed? You say, well, it's happening to me. That's not an excuse. And when we take a closer look at why am I upset? Why is this disturbing me? We don't, we don't find a very convincing and very appealing answer. Usually it's disturbing because it's not what I want. But then again, how many things are the way I want? And so what if they're not what I want? So I'm not getting what I want. There's nothing tragic or traumatic about that. 
kids, when they don't get what they want, they throw a tantrum. They get older, they realize that they're not always going to get what they want. So what's the point in throwing the tantrum? And besides, here they are all grown up. And having thrown the tantrum did not help because their parents did not give in and they didn't get what they wanted. And here they are, all grown up, healthy. So obviously, all those things they threw tantrums about, they didn't really need. Because in the end, they did without. So not having what you want is not, by definition, a tragedy or a trauma. Sometimes things are worse. It's not that you don't have what you want. It's that you do have what you don't want. And to live with what you don't want is more uncomfortable than to live with what you don't have, which you do want. But even there, so what? What do you care? Do you care because you're outraged at the immorality of it? Is it the injustice that violates your sense of right and wrong and doesn't let you sleep? Because the world is unjust? Unjust? Is it moral indignation? Maybe. But moral indignation has never made anybody crazy. I was talking to a guy who was having trouble with his marriage. His wife complained that, that from time to time he loses his temper and he beats her. So I'm talking to him. And he says, uh, he says, you, you make it sound as if uh, everything I do is wrong. But I happen to be very sensitive. Maybe, maybe I'm just exceptional. And that's why I don't tolerate these things. And you're expecting me to tolerate them as if I was some common person. Maybe I'm not so common. And after all, there have been exceptional people in the world. If we were going to, for the sake of the argument, go along with his, with his description of himself. You're exceptional, fine. You want to be among the saints when they come marching in? You want to count yourself among the exceptional people? Fine. But exceptional people don't beat their wife. So yes, maybe you are exceptional. Maybe you have exceptional sensitivities. And that's why every little thing hurts you. Just like, who knows? Just like some great person in history. But that great person in history, with all of his sensitivity, did not beat his wife. So maybe there is some moral indignation. And maybe we are sensitive people. And when things don't seem right, it somehow violates our sense of, right, of righteousness, our sense of, of balance, of reward and punishment, and so on. But that's only a small part of it. That's not what causes the breakdown of our, of our ability to function and to go on and to, and to be productive and to be good. What does that is the inflexibility of our ego. I cannot allow it to happen. Not out of moral commitment. I can't allow it to happen because I can't bend and get out of its way. I'm on a collision course with what's happening. And although it could easily be solved by sidestepping, I can't move. My ego is too heavy to budge. And so I stand there and take it right on the chin and then complain that it hurts. And people do this 10 years, 20 years, and never realize that all they have to do is just step aside, take your ego out of it, and the wind will pass without doing any damage. The storm will blow over and nothing is going to change. And yet we insist on standing in the path of the hurricane and taking it on the chin and then complaining that life is mistreating us. Because we're looking out for number one. So what does Torah say? Torah says very simply, you are a guest in this world. It is God's world. You're invited. Whatever you get is for free. What you don't get, of course not. This is not your house. If a person thinks he's living in his house and the window is open 
and he wants the window closed. He gets indignant. In my house, I can't have what I want. I want the window closed. I say, come on, what's the difference? So the window's open, the window's closed. Big deal. Well, if it's my house, it is a big deal. Then it's the principle of the matter. In my own home, I can't have what I want? Am I not capable enough or significant enough to control my own environment? This is mine. And if it's mine, why isn't it the way I want? So that would be true if it was our house. But when you're a guest in someone else's house and they keep windows open, so they keep the windows open. It's their house. You feel a little chilly, you put on a sweater. But you don't feel morally indignant and your emotions aren't crushed by the fact that they keep the window open when you prefer it closed. Because of course they can keep it open. It's their house. You're only a guest. So first of all, there is no emotional trauma. And second of all, even the cold doesn't bother you so much. It's not that cold. Whereas if it was in your house, not only would it bother you on the principle, it would feel colder. The cold would be intolerable. You'd freeze. And here, it's not so cold. On the contrary, if we are sensitive people, and we're motivated by moral considerations, whatever hospitality we get in someone else's house, not only don't we focus on what else they should be giving us, which they're not, but for whatever it is that we do get, we are thoroughly grateful. That's a mensch. So the first orientation towards life according to Torah, is not looking out for number one. The first principle is you're a guest. You're a guest in someone else's house. And that immediately takes all the burden off of your ego. What is at stake here is not your ego. That's not what life is all about. Because it's not even your house. So your ego shouldn't be offended if things are not the way you would like them to be. In your house, they'll be the way you like them to be. This is not your house. Like, uh, like the guy who came to see, to see the Bzusha, I think, or the, came to see the Magid. And he was told Magid was a great rabbi, and he thought a great rabbi must live in a beautiful house and have six white horses. And he comes and he sees he lives in a hovel, and it's dirty, and it's poor, and it's... And he was very, very upset that he was sent to such, a, to such a rabbi. He was insulted. So he comes into the, to the Maggid, and he says, this is your, ha this, you're the Maggid? He says, yeah. He says, well, where's your furniture? He says, what kind of living is this? Where's your furniture? So the Maggid says, where's your furniture? He says, what do you mean my furniture? This is not my house. My furniture is back home where I live. So Maggid said, mine too. This is also not my house. Being here on earth is not my house. So you want me to slap my furniture with me? I'm visiting here. The furniture in this particular metaphor is the ego. The guy came in and said to the Maggid, how can you stand to live here without furniture? Where's your pride? Where's your ego? So the Maggid says to him, and how can you stand to be seen without your furniture? Where's your ego? He says, my ego is fine. I have furniture at home. This is not my home. This doesn't threaten my ego, because this is not my house. So the Maggid said, it doesn't threaten my ego either. It's not my house. So why should I worry? But it's not just physical possessions, obviously. It's much more. Including even what we think of God. Avraham was told that he can't become a Jew if he maintains what he thinks of God. He's got to come to know God as God thinks of himself. So even our concept of right and wrong, even our concept of what a mitzvah should be, has to come from God and not from our ego. I, I think I mentioned this debate that I was having with this teenager from one of the youth groups at Lubavitch House for Shabbos. We were talking about some mitzvah, I forget what it was. 
And he would say, no, that's not, you don't have to do that. That's not right. And we're talking about where it says and it's, that God wants that done. And he's saying, no, that can't be God. I can't believe God would want that. The ironic part of it was that, that further on in the conversation, he made it very clear that he doesn't believe in God. But should there be a God, he could not want this. Which is really two mistakes that people make. First of all, they, they think that there's an option of not believing in God. As if that changes anything. It's like saying, I don't believe in my grandmother. So, so what is that? So you don't have a grandmother? So you don't want to go home to your grandmother? Fine, don't go home. That doesn't mean you haven't got a grandmother. Second mistake is that they think that those who do believe in God believe what they wish to believe about God. And therefore, if he believed in God, this would not be the way he would believe in God. He would believe in God differently. It's like this comedian was, was saying... He says, how do you know you're getting old? How do you know you're really old? He says, when the people in the room are talking about you as if you're not there. And they're saying, should we take him home now? <laughs> he looks tired, no? What do you think? <laughs> and you're sitting right there. You know you're old. And that's what we do with God. We're sitting around saying, what do you think? God would want this. Nah, he wouldn't want this. He couldn't want this, Never. But is he old and senile? Ask him. He knows what he wants. Ask him. He won't tell you, so you don't know. But don't sit there trying to figure him out and tell him what he wants and what he doesn't want. So what does it mean? I can't believe that God would want this. It means that you can't let God be what he is. You need God to be what you want him to be. Or how your mind can conceive of him. That's also arrogance. That's also the inflexibility of the oak. Virtue is the ability to let God be what he is and let other people be what they are and sidestep the confrontation by softening the ego by, by diminishing the ego and by minimizing it in order for the other person to have it their way you have to give up you have to give in you can't have what you want so good so don't have what you want what's the tragedy not only isn't it a tragedy it's a, it's a great virtue like the famous story about the guy who was very poor and he finally saved up enough money to buy a pair of film and his wife was complaining all along that uh, they need money for food they need money for clothing the kids are hungry the kids are cold and here he goes and he buys himself a pair of film so his wife was very angry come sukkahs they need an esrig so she finds out that her husband went and hocked the film because he won't need the film during the sukkahs he went and he sold it for and with the money he bought an expensive esser. So this she couldn't take already. And she grabbed the esser and she bit off the, uh, the tip. So they were left with no esser and no tool and no money. The husband said nothing. And, and felt no anger or no, no, uh, no grudge. He was later told in a dream that the virtue of selling his tefillin, his precious tefillin, in order to buy an esrig, doesn't compare, doesn't even come close to the virtue of not getting angry when his wife destroyed the esrig. By the principles of looking out for number one, what's, what kind of virtue is this? Where is the greatness? What's to respect? in the fact that he did not get angry. So what did he get, what did he get out, of, out of not getting angry? The esteric was destroyed, he was left without throne, he was left without money, and an angry wife on top of it all. So where's the virtue? The guy's a loser. 
It actually mazel. By the secular standards of looking out for number one, this guy is at the bottom of the ladder. And yet, by Jewish virtue and by Jewish standards, the fact that he went out and bought a big pair of tefillin, nice. The fact that he went ahead and sold the tefillin to buy an esteric for circus, beautiful. But it doesn't compare. It doesn't compare to the, to the ability to accept and focus and empathize with the other person's anger even if it leaves you with nothing. Because that's the opposite of looking out for number one. In this case, number one didn't matter. And because number one didn't matter, it wasn't that he controlled his temper, that he swallowed his pride, that he counted to ten to keep from getting angry. There was no reason to get angry. Why get angry? Where the ego is flexible, there's no trauma. In simple words, he didn't take it as a personal insult. It wasn't a contest or a struggle between him and his wife. His wife was upset. He felt bad for her. What else should he have felt? Violated? Why? What was violated? Insulted? Who was insulted? Abused? Who was abused? She was upset, that's all. She was upset because she's hungry, because the kids are hungry. So what's wrong with that? A mother shouldn't be upset if her kids are hungry. Where was the violation? In contrast that with my asterisk. What would you do to my asterisk? Your asterisk, somebody else's asterisk, what's the difference? So how to look out for number one? The best way to take care of number one, to protect it from all sorts of abuse, to shield it from all sorts of horrors and traumas, is to bury it. Because a dead ego feels no pain. What replaces what is euphemistically known as a healthy ego, <laughs> a robust ego, what replaces it emotionally and theologically is joy. That yeast, that, that special feeling, that motivation, that, that lift that ego provides really shouldn't be from ego. All of that should be coming from joy. If ego is the opposite of faith, what is the opposite of ego? What is the opposite of arrogance? The opposite of arrogance is simcha. Joy. If you can thrill to what's real, if you can rejoice with what's going on, then you don't have to fall back on your ego to give you that lift, to give you that momentum to carry you through life. When we get up in the morning and we say, thank you for not making me a non-Jew, which means I'm thrilled to be a Jew, that replaces the ego. I don't need to be me to feel uplifted, to feel good. I have to feel, I have to feel happy about, about a reality that doesn't end with me. I rejoice in being a Jew. That's not, that's not personal. It's not just me. I'm not the only Jew. And so my joy is no longer derived from being myself, whatever that means. My joy comes from being something bigger. What's even better than that 
is when I can rejoice in someone else's joy. I can be happy that I am part of something bigger. That's an improvement over ego. But it's still me, that I am part of it. What's even better than that is to feel joy for someone else's joy. I'm not part of it at all. But someone else is important. And that someone else is rejoicing over something. And somehow I can share in that joy. Which means I literally feel better. I feel good. I feel uplifted. Because somebody just had a wonderful thing happen to them. Somewhat of an example of that is when we go from a bad mood to a good mood simply because we saw a kid playing and enjoying himself. Not our kid, not somebody we know, not somebody we care about. We saw a kid enjoying himself, and it puts us in a better mood. So what, what has it got to do with you? Why are you in a better mood because you saw a kid playing and giggling? Because even though it's not your kid, we instinctively feel that a kid is precious. And when the focus of preciousness is off of me and onto somebody else, that itself is uplifting. I can now rejoice without having to have an ego. I, I'm happy because someone giggled. And so, miraculously, a person without ego can have fun, <laughs> can be happy. Humility does not automatically mean morbidity. On the contrary. So when the Torah comes along and says, put yourself in a Jewish frame of mind, it is comprised of two parts. Number one, Nobody cares about your ego, so why should you? Hmm. And number two, serve God with joy. Serve with joy. Which means to say, if this is what God wants, be happy that he has it. If this is what makes God, ha God happy, that should make you happy. How can I be happy because he's happy? What about my happiness? My happiness is not a virtue. And that's why nobody cares about it. Even good people don't care about my being happy. Because that I am happy with myself is not a mitzvah. It's not a virtue, and it's not an accomplishment, and it's not growth, and it's not maturity, and it's not healthy. It's nothing. It's a burden. On the other hand, that I should rejoice with the fact that I am part of a Jewish people, that's a virtue. That I should rejoice that there are people who are happy, that's a virtue. That I am happy that God is happy, that's a virtue. That's healthy. So looking out for number one, protecting yourself from that storm, from that straw that breaks the camel's back, very simple. Don't have a rigid back. Anyone who's ever gotten drunk <laughs> knows from experience that you fall off a chair, you hurt yourself, but not when you're drunk. When you're drunk, you fall down a flight of stairs and you don't hurt yourself. But, but it's not the fall that hurts. And the reason? Because when you're drunk and you're falling, you don't care. And if you don't care, you don't stiffen. You don't tighten up. If you don't tighten up, you really roll down the stairs. You don't fall. But when you're stiff, even if it's one step, you fall down one step, you crash and break into a thousand pieces because, because you're brittle, because you're trying to stop yourself from falling, because you tighten up, because you become stiff. And I think that if we, 
if we took a look at the things that bother us the most, it's only because we're tightening up. Because we think that by becoming stiff, we're protecting, looking out for number one. We're not. We're destroying it. The only way to look out for number one is to let it fall. Nothing will happen. It'll roll. It'll pick itself up. And what we should take seriously, and what we should get intense, is in those things that we do not automatically, instinctively, and naturally take seriously. And that's growth. That's change. The things that we take seriously instinctively, we can, we can relax about. And the things that we are careless about instinctively, we should become a little more careful. Focus out of ourselves, and our self will be fine. Focus on yourself, and it'll never be fine. Like the relation between the body and the soul, simply the physical relationship. A healthy body is a body that doesn't care. It does whatever the soul wants. As soon as the body starts caring, you've got an unhealthy body. As soon as the body starts having wills of its own, and wants of its own, and sensations of its own, it's time to go to the doctor. It's good to have an arm, but the arm should never say anything. It's good to have a heart, but you should never hear from it. It's good to have a spleen, you should never know where it is. If you never find out where your spleen is, you have a healthy spleen. If, God forbid, you know you have a spleen, it's not a good spleen. So like the body is healthiest when it doesn't know of itself, when it doesn't hear from itself, when it doesn't want and it doesn't think and it doesn't demand, in the same way our ego, which is really associated with the body, the healthiest ego is an ego that doesn't that you don't hear from, that you don't that doesn't want anything, that doesn't say anything, that doesn't have an opinion, and doesn't have any needs. That's a healthy ego. Because then you're free to do what you're supposed to do. And that is looking out for number one, capital O.